Okay, let's make a start. Dear participants, welcome to IFLA's virtual Resilia by Mandy Occult event, in which we'll, we will explore the topic, Libraries Enabling Inclusive and Meaningful Participation in Cultural Life. My name is Claire McGuire. I'm a policy and research officer at IFLA headquarters, and I will be moderating today's event. You can find my contact information here on the screen if you have any comments or questions or would like to get in touch following today's events. On your screen, you will see an overview of the flow of today's event. Um, following a short introduction, we will have a panel discussion in which we will spend roughly 15 to 20 minutes per question for a total of four questions. This will be followed by a questions and answers portion and um, conclusions. I will begin by giving just a bit of context to frame today's events. Today's panelists, and indeed all of you here in the audience, are helping to bring the perspectives of library and information professionals into the preparatory process for the upcoming UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policy and Sustainable Development, Mondi Occult 2022. 40 years after the first Mondi Occult World Conference on Cultural Policy, world leaders, cultural ministers, Representatives from civil society and a range of other stakeholders will once again convene in Mexico City to embark on a renewed reflection on cultural policies and how they help us tackle global challenges. One of the main outcomes of the first Mandia Cult Conference was the expansion of the concept of culture in which it was redefined to encompass values expressed in everyday life such as language, traditions, beliefs, artifacts, dance, oral traditions, literature, works of art, and the collections of archives and libraries. The upcoming Mandi Occult 2022 will build on this legacy and outline immediate and future priorities in order to shape a more robust and resilient cultural sector in line with the goals of sustainable development. It will take into account new challenges facing both the sector and humanity, climate change, rapid urbanization, social unrest, widening wealth disparity, digital transformation, and more. The process to define the agenda of Mandia Cult 2022 is participatory, and UNESCO has invited all stakeholders to help conceptualize the high-level deliberation leading up to Mandia Cult and inform its outcomes through the organization of Resiliart by Mandi Occult events. Resiliart is, is an inclusive initiative developed by UNESCO that acts as a conduit between voices on the ground and decision makers. These events invite stakeholders together to discuss their role in the cultural sector, how, how their work contributes to sustainable development and make their perspective on needs, gaps and opportunities heard. Resilier by Mandi Occult is an opportunity to add our voices to the global policy dialogue in the field of culture, to inspire a discussion, invite different perspectives, inform priorities, and bring libraries to the table. Following today's events, a summary will be compiled by IFLA headquarters and shared with UNESCO via the Resilier by Mandi Occult platform. Now, with that context in mind, I will move on to introduce the content and structure of today's event. UNESCO has proposed a range of topics that might be relevant for resilient debates. With these in mind, IFLA went about organizing this event to make space for a range of library and information professionals to take part in a broad strokes discussion on a variety of ways that libraries enable inclusive and meaningful participation in cultural life. Libraries are vital pieces of the cultural infrastructure, enabling the discovery, creation, and enjoyment of diverse expressions of culture to be a part of everyday life. To give just a few examples, they help ensure the safeguarding of the memory of the world and all its diversity. They are community spaces concerned with upholding freedom of expression and access to information and the right to participate in the cultural life of one's community. Drawing on their collections, 
as well as the expertise and dedication of their staff, they offer unique opportunities for exploration, exchange, and open dialogue that builds multicultural respect. And they have a key role to play in digital inclusion, and in particular, as providers of non-formal education and lifelong learning, and building skills for cultural participation in the digital world. There are so many ways that libraries contribute to upholding cultural rights, but are they being recognized in wider cultural policy discussions? Through our engagement in processes like the preparation for Mandi Cult 2022, IFLA works to communicate the key message when envisioning cultural policies that help build inclusive and resilient societies, libraries must be counted in. The majority of today's event will be a conversation between our panelists. This conversation will be guided by four questions, which explore different vectors of the role libraries play in enabling inclusive and meaningful participation in cultural life. Aligning with key priority areas in COVID-19 recovery and sustainable development, speakers will be encouraged to examine the discussion questions through the lens of several different topics, including cultural participation in the digital environment, access and fair and balanced copyright, connecting culture to the community and public participation, libraries preserving and providing access to cultural heritage and diversity, especially the intersection of multilingualism and participation in culture. Panelists will share insight on these topics, but also are encouraged to exchange freely. I hope today will be a conversation between our panel, but also with the audience. And audience members can have a chance to provide input and ask questions using the Q&A box and the chat function below. With that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. For the sake of time, I won't read their full biographies, but you can find more information about each panelist on our website. I am delighted to introduce Ariadna Mandis, Policy Advisor at Europeana, Hayford Xia, Executive Director of the Ghana Library Authority, Jonathan Hernandez of the National Autonomous or associated researcher at the Library and Information Institute at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and IFLA governing board member. Rai Moran, associate library, university librarian reconciliation at the University of Victoria and IFLA advisory committee on cultural heritage member. And Virginia Vassar, manager immigrant and refugee service programs at the Denver Public Library. Thank you all for being here today. Now, without further ado, let our conversation today start. I will begin with our first question for the panel. This is a broad question, but given the topic of today's event, I wanted to ask this first as a sort of foundation on which we can expand um, on the next questions. This is also a good time to keep in mind those different lenses through which we may examine the role of libraries in the cultural infrastructure. So I pose to you, in your experience, how do libraries enable inclusive and meaningful access to culture? And um, can I start with Jonathan? Uh, not only is Mexico City the host of Mandia Cult 2022, um, but Guadalajara was named World Book Capital for 2022. Um, and I just note that among the themes of the World Book Capital program is a focus on social bonding and cohesion by way of connection to communities. As libraries are public spaces in the social fabric, could you perhaps speak to the role of libraries in providing communities inclusive and meaningful access to culture? Thank you, Claire. And hi, uh, everyone. Uh, I just want to mention that I'm glad that Mondia Cult is in Mexico again, and we have so many good things happen uh, in the field of culture in Mexico. So let's pretend, let's pretend we are in Mexico now, and uh, I'm glad to have this conversation and to know all of you. So, well, libraries enables access to culture in several important ways. Uh, they have, as we know, indoor and outdoor spaces that host various cultural events. And of course, this has turned to the outdoor and online spaces now with the pandemic. But let's talk in a wider context. And I would like to point out the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in its Article 27 that states that everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community 
and to enjoy the art and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And libraries, particularly public and academic libraries, are already very involved in arts and culture. And I un or underline here academic libraries as my experience in Mexico and in many Latin American countries that they are acting as a public libraries too. Uh, this is mainly due to a lack of investment from federal governments to the public libraries in some cases, not in all cases, and uh, sometimes because of their location of the academic libraries. So in many cases, these academic libraries are also a getaway to a community or regions more comprehensive cultural offers, including museums, theaters, heritage projects, and galleries. So if we consider that participation in culture contributes to community cohesion and reduce social in inequalities, then the whole cultural activities within the libraries uh, make conditions for this to happen. And speaking about the cultural activities, uh, we know, we all know that libraries have a wide range of these. There are the traditional exhibitions, debate, conference, uh, meeting with authors, reading contests, to the more innovative ones, such as, uh, well, there are, no, there are now plenty of, of uh, regional exhibition touring to a local libraries uh, on a bike, and uh, which involve also a cultural conversation. There are many hackathons, there are many creative codization, among others. So, and all of this is in line with the role art and culture is taking in our contemporary society. And there is also something that is increasing in many libraries, particularly in Mexican public libraries, that they are supporting the development of local emerging artists from its neighborhood. And I mean it this in, in the whole diversity sense. For example, in, in a public library in San Luis Potosí, a state from Mexico, uh, this library promotes their young local rappers and graffiti artists in their communities. They are doing a great job uh, promoting these artists, and this is replicating in other public libraries. So I think that this is important to address that uh, something is, is happening, it's changing in, in, in libraries. And for example, I would like to highlight two brief examples of this. Some libraries are going beyond the traditional reminder about some cultural or historical event. The typical on this day happens uh, certain uh, uh, certain things. And they are making cultural events for holidays, for historical events in a very creative way. For example, I have seen libraries in Latin America with more comprehensive programs on International Women's Day, for example, and on the World Mental Health Day, among many uh, others. And there, are, there is plenty of evidence where libraries are reinforcing their role as cultural hubs within communities and getaways to broader cultural activities locally. Uh, it's important to remark that libraries encourage people to explore their own culture, their own self-expression self and creative enrichment. And well, finally, uh, a second thought on this is related to the digital scenario and its adoption in libraries. I know that we will talk about uh, more on this, but uh, just to mention that in the past two decades, two de decades, digital technologies have transformed the cultural scenes profoundly. And libraries have been aware of this by making cultural spaces for creativity, such as computer lab, and uh, some of them are using in artificial intelligence. Um, by this, I mean not, uh, I mean, artificial intelligence is on the phone, on uh, normal devices, so, uh, and, 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 and others. And let's do not forget that libraries are offering uh, tools for content creators. Here in Mexico, there are many libraries that, uh, le uh, that uh, let their spaces to TikTokers, for example, to YouTubers, uh, that uh, so they can uh, create content for their own community. So I will put it here. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Jonathan, for those um, really practical examples, especially um, really innovative examples that um, libraries are not only connecting people with their own histories, their own heritage, but also giving space for creators to create new cultural expressions. I think those are two different 
um, really important aspects of library work in this regard. Um, I'd like to now go over to you, um, Hayford. Your work has included expanding Ghana's public library footprint and changing the perception of um, public libraries among people in Ghana. So what is your perspective on this angle of library's mission? Well, um, from the perspective of, 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 of Ghana, um, over the, the years, um, if you've looked at uh, how um, a public library system within the within the sub region have have evolved uh, it's it's been really quite traditional in, in in nature but what we have seen over the last decade is a transitioning into being more responsive to the needs of our society um, there is there is quite a, a, an enormous role that the libraries, uh, especially for Ghana Library Authority, has been playing in terms of even language preservation. Um, for some time now, uh, we used to advocate, for example, for uh, what we call the mother tongue uh, uh, language in terms of early, early grade education. Now, over the years, what has happened is that we've transitioned into using uh, English language to start with. Now, with that lost, with that lost in terms of mother tongue um, uh, language, uh, starting with these young people at this early age, what the library has done is to be able to preserve these mother tongue languages, uh, be able to create them into digital format and make them, you know, accessible as part of a cultural preservation initiative, and also enabling access to our citizens that are interested in also learning. Uh, even those in the diaspora, uh, Africans born out, outside the continent and and losing uh, and losing their their culture and identity, which language plays a very critical role. Um, the library has positioned position itself to be able to create uh, resources uh, that enables uh, people that are interested in, in, in assessing uh, these form of uh, learning opportunities in terms of their mother tongue uh, to be able to ha have access, access, access to them. Um, for, 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 for Ghana, for also, once again, um, if you understand the history behind the food we eat, the, the clothes we wear, all of these historical information have been transferred from generation to generation orally. And so how will you find a lot of our resources, a lot of, a lot of our resources in print? And so as libraries, we have positioned ourselves to be able to uh, develop these oral history uh, recording uh, journey to be able to create resources. And I was involved in a project that was funded by the European Union and African per uh, Caribbean and Pacific region, which worked with Microsoft to develop an app that crowdsourced for uh, recording of oral narratives so that we can preserve them uh, uh, for, 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 for access, you know, um, uh, for, for posterity. And, and that is one crucial role uh, libraries has been able to uh, play in terms of being the, creating that resilience within the culture settings of, of our country. I think that, thank you very much for that perspective. I think um, you've hit on a really important aspect when we're talking about cultural preservation um, and cultural transmission. And that is that not all cultural expressions are in a physical format. And um, being able to integrate that into the library's function um, is a really important aspect, I'm sure, in. Um, in Ghana and in, in much of Africa, but also in many other parts of the world. So thank you for that very much. Um, and now um, I turn to you, uh, Virginia, you are um, also coming from public libraries. Um, and I know that you do work with um, immigrant and refugee service programs that of course involve multicultural and multilingual communities as well. Um, that, li that likely have um, specific needs. Um, so how do you see the role of inclusive and meaningful access to culture um, featuring in your work? Yes, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I think that libraries are extremely important spaces for this um, for this topic and for cultural access. For one thing, uh, I think that libraries are some of the the only spaces, um, at least speaking for Denver and the the U.S. in general, where people from different class backgrounds come together. I think even other spaces that <clears throat> are intended to serve that purpose end up becoming um, very segregated by class or by socio, you know, socioeconomic background or cultural background. And I think so libraries have, have sort of an advantage or public libraries have an advantage in that people are already sharing space. Um, and so when we offer access to um, materials and programming around the arts, around culture, um, there's an ability for people to participate without any prerequisites that they might need in other, other locations. Um, and so I think where we need to focus our work is on making sure that, I think the, the inclusive piece of, of this question, the inclusive access is the real, the real area of focus because I think there can be un, uh, kind of invisible prerequisites that people need in order to participate fully. You know, are people able to um, participate in these, in these opportunities in the language of their own creativity? Are people feeling like uh, an equal when they come to the table? Are they feeling respected? Are they feeling like they can show up as their whole self? And so that's where libraries uh, really need to get creative in, in how we offer and, and, and how those barriers are being reduced for people. So um, just a couple of specific examples, I think of, of some create, creative projects that, that help um, in this area that we've been working on. Um, for one thing, the program that I manage, which is called Plaza, uh, is, is designed intentionally to create space where kind of relationship building is first so that when those um, moments come up where something is not inclusive, we, we have the relationships to find out about it and hear about it. We focus on the name Plaza um, to, to, to keep that focus on that the idea of the space um, and the place to come together versus the different services that we offer like English conversation and citizenship help and, and things like that. So I think that's been an important piece of, of bringing together those different aspects and making sure our programming is inclusive. And we've also done some really cool um, different projects. Uh, we've, we've even taken field trips from the library locations to cultural institutions um, to give people a community around access to those other organizations and other institutions that are offering those cultural experiences. Um, and then we also have a project that's very near and dear to my heart called Mementos from Home, which is available online if, if anyone's curious about uh, looking it up. It's pretty cool. We have worked with um, people who have come into our programming to record stories about um, artifacts that they've brought with them from their home. Uh, and they've recorded themselves talking, we've recorded people talking about uh, what the items mean to them, the stories behind them, and they record those in the language that they prefer. So we have stories in Russian and French and Spanish, of course, and um, other languages and, and just talking about what those items mean since it's such a, uh, a touch point for everyone that everyone has meaningful items that, that they carry with them. So projects like that can really make sure that the playing field is level and that people can show up as their entire self when they're engaging in library programming. Thank you, thank you for those, those examples. Um, I really love that idea of using the library as a community builder to then create a, a community that can go out to other institutions where the barrier might be a bit higher, um, but create a safe space within the library that can be extended out to experience other cultural institutions. I think that's a really interesting concept. Um, so thank you for raising that. Um, and, and now to Ariadna, your work in policy at Europeana, it, it brings an interesting perspective here. Um, Europeana's work concerns sharing and promoting um, European cultural heritage for use and enjoyment for everyone, um, for learning or work or fun or creativity. Um, so in your perspective, what is the role of GLAM institutions like libraries in enabling inclusive and meaningful access to culture? 
Uh, thank you, Claire, and, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, so far, the interventions have been really interesting. Um, so as you said, my focus is very much on digital cultural heritage in Europe, and in particular, um, the role that copyright and other policies might play in this field. So taking, a, taking the conversation a little bit towards my um, area of expertise, um, uh, I would say that one, one of the essential ways through which libraries enable inclusive and meaningful access to culture is by taking care of preserving our heritage and also ensuring that it is disseminated and that it reaches the right audiences. Um, if, if we talk, for instance, about well, one of the most complicated uh, corporate related questions, which is um, uh, the moment, like understanding where a moment where a work enters the public domain, um, and therefore the moment where society can benefit fully from the creativity of, of past um, uh, people or, or just not necessarily creativity, but research, findings, data, any type of information that is um, uh, well, uh, very often by default protected by copyright. Um, so many years have to pass that it's very likely that the moment that society can start enjoying the materials, the materials are not there anymore for people to enjoy. Um, but that's where libraries and other cultural heritage institutions come in with the very important role of ensuring that this material is still there uh, for, for society to enjoy um, when the time comes and hopefully before that as well. Um, well, I think libraries also have an essential role in, in disseminating um, cultural heritage, ensuring that it can be studied, used in education, um, uh, used in, in creativity in many ways, especially um, in a world of culture 3.0 where materials are used in a very agile way online. Um, everything that libraries preserve and curate should also be available for this type of use uh, to have a positive impact on society. Um, and I think they, they constantly explore how new technologies come in and, and help fulfill this mission uh, better. Um, and I think we'll talk about this probably in a moment, but um, policies, cultural policies, um, legal policies, funding, etc., needs to um, enable uh, this to happen because otherwise it can it can hamper this very important uh, set of activities um, and I think we've seen many good examples of how being able to provide access especially online to those who need access to certain materials has been essential during a pandemic where people had to stay at home and could not access certain materials otherwise but even outside of a pandemic um, uh, it, is, it doesn't seem reasonable anymore to make a researcher travel uh, thousands of kilometers to be able to access certain documentation where, uh, for which we have capacity and the technological means to make it available to the public otherwise. So it should not be because of policies or, or the law that this cannot happen. Um, but I think we'll go into that in, in a moment. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you for, I think it is important to bring in this aspect um, of, of a very real practical concept of access. Um, and as you say, we will explore a few, we'll explore that concept through a few of the, 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 the upcoming questions as well. So finally on this question, I, I turn to, to Rai. Um, we, we look at inclusive and meaningful access to culture from a lot of different angles. So. Um, how do you see libraries having a role in, in enabling this? Yeah, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> good morning here from uh, the west side of Canada, actually, where I'm uh, sitting right now, the territories of the Lekwungen people and the Wasanic people. Um, uh, I would like to also just echo uh, the very valuable contributions of my fellow panelists here, and I agree with everything. Uh, I think in the context of what I'm seeing here, um, I think, we can remember that libraries like in their essence are cultural institutions they reflect a particular culture they reflect reflect a particular sort of genesis of how knowledge is both created um, and manifested and shared <clears throat> i think here in canada right now one of the big questions that we have is just um <clears throat> whose cultures are represented within the libraries and whose haven't been uh how we as a sector I think need to do a lot more work to ensure that, uh, especially indigenous people's cultures are accurately reflected and fully included within our spaces. 
Um, so that includes thinking about how we think about our institutions right from the very outset through the entry point of, uh, upon walking through the doors, right through to what material is present on the shelves. Um, <clears throat> to more programmatic aspects, for example, uh, you know, we've already talked about oral history, certainly a lot of the knowledge that has been um, created here in um, Indigenous Canada has been transmitted orally. Uh, and some of it now is being written down, some of it is being translated into theses and dissertations and other publications, but a lot of it re remains within the community. And I think cultural institutions have a lot of work to do to build trust. Uh, with communities in order to be respectful repositories or appropriate repositories for that information. So the, the role that libraries play is, is not just, you know, from a service model, not just from holding information, but it's very much externally focused and it's very relational in terms of building relationships with, with people and sources of information and sources of knowledge uh, that ultimately come together to serve a, a collective good or a collective benefit. I think the bringing together of this information, the bringing together of information from diffuse and uh, diverse communities is at its heart what libraries do as well. And it allows a user to navigate uh, you know, multiple different perspectives on lots of different issues, which ultimately is to the benefit and to the enrichment of society as a whole. I think um, you know, more broadly, uh, yeah, again, here uh, in Canada, one of the big questions that we have right now, we've already talked about the implement or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but here, uh, sort of the, the leading edge of that in some ways is the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And thinking there that uh, certain articles reflect the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples to transmit their knowledges to future generations. So I see libraries as really sitting at this really fascinating nexus the wherein there's the relationship, that inherent relationship between the past, the present and the future. And it's that continuum of action, that continuum of, um, of ability to provide re, uh, access to resources that reflect our past, to help us better understand our present, to certainly um, help us navigate our um, still to be determined future and our, and our somewhat uncertain future. And, uh, and I think in this regard, libraries have a really important role to play in cementing or highlighting these very fundamental human rights concepts that actually help stimulate and enable uh, a positive future for everyone. So be that the Sustainable Development Goals, be that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, be that mechanisms like the Universal um, uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the libraries themselves have a very active role to play in fostering cultures that fully embrace and support these mechanisms and see these as solutions to some of the most longstanding and complex challenges that we've been grappling with as, as a human family. Um, I think lastly, I'll just say that, um, I mean, libraries are, are such incredibly rich places uh, wherein the, the full breadth of the human experience um, is often reflected, but, you know, we can think about culture as being, you know, arts, we can also think about culture as being politics, we can think about, you know, culture is very, very dense, it's many, many, many things. And I think, uh, you know, encouraging people to access and engage with and reflect on their own uh, abilities and responsibilities as citizens and to um, stimulate ongoing conversation about what all what it, what it means to be part of a culture and especially nowadays, what it means to be uh, part of uh, an inclusive and respectful culture uh, is really where libraries can play a, just an absolutely critical and important role. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think that's a really interesting idea of this um, kind of discussing how how we exist in a culture and being a, a catalyst for this sort of understanding that's really driven by um, these different um, human rights um, frameworks. So um, thank you to everybody for, for your responses here. I think we've gotten a lot of different um, really interesting examples. And and I, I and, and I also really appreciate the um, the 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 points that have been brought up by each speaker on on what what can be done, what isn't being done, what must be done. Um, and and I wanted to ask this first question to lay this groundwork so we can discuss a little bit more of challenges and um, and recommendations and and gaps that that might need to be addressed um, to 
both improve library work in this regard, but also to help libraries improve this, have the space to improve this work and to reach um, these, their, their audiences in a more effective way. So with that, and um, with time in mind, I'll move on to the second question. Um, the emergence of new technology has affected how libraries help their communities access and engage with culture. The digital transformation and the ability to participate in culture in the digital environment have, um, as we've mentioned, become even more um, pressing during, through the pandemic, but this makes the digital divide, that is the, the gap in access to modern information and communications technologies even more urgent to address. So the next question I would like to pose is, what are some challenges and opportunities that the emergence of new technologies presents um, for engaging in cultures? And how might libraries address these? How do libraries already address these? And, and, and what might um, need to be done to enable libraries to address this further? So just to, to note, engaging in culture, that can include access to collections, um, access to library cultural programming, to community-oriented events, to the arts, um, to participation in the cultural and creative industries, just to give um, a little bit of context to that uh, engaging in culture. Um, so I will start with you, um, Hayford. You have been active in restructuring and redesigning library services in your career. Um, have you seen an impact, and, and I'm, I'm sure you have, of, of the emergence of new technology? Um, and, and what are some of the challenges that you're facing in that regard? Uh, th thank you very much. I think the, the emergence of new technologies um, within the space has, has helped a lot of developing countries and particularly Ghana to leapfrog on most of its strategies on how it connects the citizens to knowledge resources. Um, over the past uh, few years, uh, one critical um, observation uh, is the huge digital divide that has occurred between uh, those in the urban areas and those in the rural areas. So beside the huge gap in, in terms of access to technology, uh, it has also created um, what, what I, I call the, the digital illiteracy pandemic, where you have a huge chunk of your population who are not digitally literate and therefore are not able to enjoy the opportunities that are presented in this digital age. And so one of key, key, key strategies that the library authority has tried to put forward to be able to support the citizens of this country is to undertake proactive initiatives uh, through partnership with both the private sector and the public sector to be able to make digital literacy uh, skills available to most population. And we do not only tackle, say, young people, but we also tackle out of school uh, grown ups in terms of offering uh, digital literacy skills. Within our static library, we have even moved beyond, we have even moved beyond addressing this, 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 this gap into even organizing what we call the mobile ICT project, where our mobile vans now goes with computers loaded with resources and are able to undertake classes outside the confines of our static uh, library environment. And so this has been really uh, one of the strategic initiatives that you know, uh, we've rolled out with the support of Vodafone and the Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communication to make sure that we, 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 have, we are able to engage you know, a lot of our citizens. Beside the literacy gap, also there's the connectivity gap that exists. Though Ghana has experienced, or most part of the continent have experienced a, a rise in, uh, in, in, in broadband and connectivity, there is still a huge chunk of our population that do not have access. What we have done in this country 
is to use notes of libraries across uh, the length and breadth of this country. Over the past four years, we've moved from 61 public libraries to 109 public libraries within just four years. What we are, what we are doing is that we are setting these uh, libraries up to be able to offer access to those that do not have access. So as this centers, our citizens are being given the opportunity to be digitally literate, but at the same time, they are also connecting to the outside world because it is not enough knowing and learning how to use Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, but it is also important that you are able to engage with other people through the use of uh, internet and be able to access different uh, resources. So internet connectivity has been a, a great tool for us and we will uh, invite uh, other partners and stakeholders who who are interested to to work with us and invest in uh, in, in extending you know connectivity access to to our citizens be as it may be as it may that in doing all of this we understand that the role of the static library environment to be able to enhance human touch is still very important and so though we try to uh, 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 innovate and that is one of the one of the key attributes that you know researchers have always advocated for for how libraries will be very innovative in being able to explore the use of digital resources we also try as much as possible that we don't eliminate the human touch because we believe that uh, the library space, uh, these social spaces. We know th the onset of the COVID pandemic has gotten everybody to relax at home and everybody is talking remotely, but the library space still remains a, a very, uh, a very good uh, environment for us to be connect to connect, you know, uh, uh, physically. And I think that is probably one of the key uh, 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 challenges that people have been trying to um, uh, talk about in terms of in terms of uh, the onset of technology and how we are losing touch as human beings. One of the critical challenges that I will probably want to also share with you is how we manage, you know, this whole um, process of culture change, where there is a change in and you know more there's a, there's less contact with with people and all of us are moving uh you know to be able to advance availability of our resources using technologies i think managing that change process is really really uh, a hurdle especially in people that, that you know uh, that 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 um, that have not had the opportunity of this huge uh, uh, wave of, of the use of technology in doing a lot of things. You know, so Adelaide, in Ghana right now, there is the uh, compulsory registration of all mobile SIM cards. Okay. And you have, and, and people have to dial something on their phone, and people are completely, you know, <laughs> ignorant of, of, of the use of these mobile technologies and how all, do all of these codes happen libraries are providing all of these support services so that people you know our citizens can be able to access some of these technologies be able to get their data captured in, in government repository so that they can benefit from what the society have have, have for um, have for them and so these are the key areas of opportunities and the challenges that i will advance on and, and hopefully i think my colleagues will also uh, throw more light on some of these issues Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's very interesting to hear some of the work that you have already done in this regard. Um, I'm quite interested as well in, um, you've mentioned the, this work has been carried out through um, these public-private partnerships. And I think when we come to the final question, when we're looking at what initiatives and policies might be able to, to help this go further, I think might have lost Claire. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I wonder if broke us. Um, we oh, no. have... yeah. oh, there we are. Yeah. She's back. <laughs> You're back now. Oh, oh okay. okay. Moment, yeah. Oh, You're no. Broken. Oh, no. Okay. Well, hopefully that... Um, usually my internet is quite stable, so hopefully it is okay. Um, I was... I don't know where I, I dropped off, but um, I said I was I was quite fascinated in, in this idea of the public-private partnerships that 
you have worked with. And I'm interested to hear when we get to the final question, looking at suggestions on policies or initiatives, um, I'm interested to hear how you build on this. Um, so now to move back over to you, um, Ariadna, um, you, you've already touched on this a bit in the first question, but um, digital access to cultural expressions and the arts and digital cultural heritage, of course, it has a, a large implication on issues around, uh, on legal issues, copyright and access. Um, could you share some insight on, on challenges and, and perhaps also gaps in this that, that should be addressed? Uh, sure, thank you, Claire. Um, so yeah, I, I would start by flagging the opportunities of what digital technologies uh, present. Um, I think there's lots of things that libraries are exploring and already doing taking advantage of the like the possibilities out there. And if in the context that I work with, for instance, um, where uh, there's some cultural heritage that have been that have been, has been digitized and made available through a single platform, uh, this presents amazing opportunities for research uh, through using technologies um, such as mass analysis of data so we can make the content more searchable, easy to find, we can transcribe it, by transcribing it, we can then translate it. Um, this makes the content a lot more accessible, so it becomes relevant for uh, many more audiences. Um, by training um, AI models, we can then analyze the data, enrich it, annotate it. Um, so there's a lot of great things that I think can happen um, if we can take advantage of the opportunities um, of certain technologies. Um, as part of this, I think, there are very obvious uh, challenges, uh, especially uh, legal ones, as you were pointing out, because to be able to do all this, uh, libraries have to be able to make copies, um, to disseminate knowledge, etc. And we're always talking about knowledge to which the libraries don't necessarily own the copyright. So I think, um, unfortunately, many copyright laws the, uh, around the world still do not recognize some very basic uh, things that libraries should be able to do with the content they, they preserve and curate and, and want to disseminate. Um, and as long as laws are behind the opportunities that digital technologies provide, we will be uh, missing certain, certain opportunities. And I think it's very important that decision makers recognize that libraries are a trustworthy institution. Um, making some things legal for these type of institutions and the audiences they interact with is not, it's nothing crazy. It's actually something very sensible um, that should happen as soon as possible. Um, th there are some challenges that we observe um, as well as we try to make, for instance, in our context, we try to make content as reusable as possible so that anyone for any reason can um, take a specific work and, and use it in their context. It can be for artistic purposes, for uh, journalism, et cetera. Um, but we also come more and more often across the, well, the idea that certain things should maybe not have been made available in the first place because they were made available in a moment where uh, the institutions were not sufficiently in touch with the relevant communities. Um, so I think in this, context, there's also a lot of literacy to be built um, to ensure that those who curate the material are in touch with those who might be affected by this material being shared and disseminated, and that they can have a say on whether it should be shared and disseminated in the first place. Um, there was a, a, a recent uh, report by Creative Commons who that was looking into the ethics of encouraging reuse by a uh, um, using Creative Commons licenses. And one of the things that were flagged is if there are already problems created by sharing certain material, attaching a Creative Commons license only maximizes the, the damage and the harm. So this should be used uh, with a, a, a being very careful. Um, so, well, I think this, this is an important uh, challenge that needs to be addressed at the moment. And the more we use uh, digitized cultural heritage for, for instance, AI purposes, the more these type of questions arise because we're working with data that might have biases. So the, these biases are just carried over by the, uh, the models and algorithms that are built based on, on this data. So this is becoming uh, very relevant as well. I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and I'm looking forward to listen to 
see you there, colleague. Thank you, Ariadna. Those are really um, key points to bring up, not just the, the, the legal support for libraries to, to be able to um, continue to curate and share the information in their collections, but also that idea of um, ensuring that the, the original permissions to do so were there. And, and that, that makes me think of the, um, the care principles for indigenous data governance, for example, around um, um, the right to self-determination to for how information is used. Um, so thank you for, for bringing up, and I'm sure we will touch on this um, a little bit further as we go along. Um, so now I will turn back over to you, Rai. Um, technological advances have changed how we can access and learn from cultural heritage and documentary heritage, archival material, and so on. So um, I, I pose this same question to you. What are some of those challenges and opportunities um, associated um, with this that you have experienced? Yeah, thank you. And um, again, fascinating conversation. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, just picking up on, on you know, some of the, the ethical considerations in regards to, to digital information, um, at least what I've seen here in Canada is that um, there has been a, a very important emphasis placed on uh, preserving and protecting oral histories uh, and that and the digitization of those oral histories. Um, so for for a long period of time here in this country, uh, Indigenous cultures specifically really were not valued by the Canadian state and were um, not um, sufficiently protected and or preserved. Uh, the handful of efforts that did occur uh, were, you know, often done by individual researchers or small community projects. And a lot of those tapes, you know, as we all know across the world, uh, were, were recorded on real to real tapes. Um, one of the uh, efforts that has happened here in Canada was uh, there have been funds provided at, through the state and through our major archival institutions to preserve that material and digitize that material. But as we also know, digitizing something only starts the long term preservation of that material. And I think questions around long-term preservation of very important histories is a really significant challenge that we have still yet to fully overcome. This is not new news. This is you know fairly old news uh, within the uh, archival community. But I think the, the issue is actually becoming greater over time in some regards. Uh, so we went from the shift from analog to digital. Um, you know, a major part of the focus was on uh, audio based materials. Audio formats have generally stabilized and preservation of audio materials is relatively manageable with fairly robust systems. But of course, following on the tail of audio has been the rise of video and, and increased uh, um, quality, uh, depth, bit rates, um, resolution of video formats over time. Um, this is phenomenal. This is, you know, totally and completely enriched uh, the society in which we live. But the long term preservation of video formats, I think, remains still a fairly significant challenge um, and opportunity for libraries uh, moving forward. The um, I think where libraries and major institutions can play a particularly important role in all of this is being these kind of economies of scale that can operate large servers, uh, large servers necessary and large storage infrastructure necessary to ensure the long term preservation of this information. Because the preservation of, of video still, when we look at, uh, you know, deep archiving of it is still quite heavy. It's, it's quite heavy in terms of a data load. It's quite heavy in terms of the amount of infrastructure that's required and the expertise to really care for that material over time as well. Uh, so I think libraries, archives, cultural institutions, uh, universities, um, uh, research libraries, so on and so forth, have a, an incredibly important role to play in regards to the uh, respectful curation of material over time and the safeguarding of that material. And we can even think just, you know, even how much the pandemic has increased the amount of video content that's out there now. Sooner or later, we're all, all gonna have to figure out how to preserve these Zoom recordings that we're making on a daily basis now, right? And libraries are gonna be a big, big part of that. How are we going to preserve this very conversation now to transmit that to future generations and give them the benefit of understanding what challenges we were dealing with at this very day? Um, 
it's a big opportunity. It's a big challenge. It's something that we have to absolutely be turning our mind to. But, uh, you know, with all of the other related um, technologies that come along with this through AI, through the automatic transcription, we're also looking at incredibly rich data and incredibly powerful resources that are going to uh, just um, allow just a, a massive amount of, of uh, discovery in the future if we can really do our job well in the, in the near and, and coming term. Thank you for bringing that um that aspect of digital preservation and preservation of both digitized and born digital material as that is ever growing. Um, and that, that makes me think of the UNESCO Persist program that is really concerned with just trying to wrap um, our collective heads around the parameters of this and, and how you go about um, preserving digital material. So I would I would point, IFLA has been doing some work in this and last year we've launched um, a second edition of um, guidelines for the long-term preservation of digital heritage um, selection guidelines. So looking to talk about what material even gets selected. So I think that's a really important point that should be amplified outside of the library and archival worlds where that's a long-term issue to, to um, to really make that known that that is a key challenge that is going to touch on a lot of different um, aspects of, of preserving our collective memory. So thank you, Rai, for that. Um, and so now over to, to you, Virginia, um, working with, um, with, with your communities and in your library, what are some of the, the challenges and opportunities you faced regarding technological advances? Yeah, I think it's been an interesting time in the last couple of years. I mean, during the pandemic, obviously, we had to move a lot of our services and programs um, to online spaces. And, you know, it, it's great that the technology existed. And I think it's continued to improve um, rapidly throughout this time to make things more accessible. But uh, we've discovered a couple of really interesting and unexpected things um, that were that were helpful um, about some of these shifts. One being, I think that language access has has been uh, we've we've improved our ability to offer better language access with some of the tools that um, online services have provided. Um, for example, you know, offering interpretation during meetings has become easier in a way that it was not before. Um, live. I mean, it was, it's possible, but but it, it's it's you know assuming people can access the technology, which is the hard part. Um, it's you can offer a lot, and also being able to offer things more on demand. We we started shifting our legal services that we used to offer in person to phone based um, legal services, which really improved uh, the privacy that people could expect, but also it allowed for us to use on-demand phone interpretation, which we, we never had the ability to, to get interpreters um, quickly enough to make that happen in person when we had the in-person legal help. So that's been some really interesting things. And then also I think we've, we've been able to connect with some new um, communities in, in really interesting ways. I think there were a lot of barriers that were there before um, in terms of like transportation uh, or childcare where people have been able to engage with our programming online. Um, and then also I think there's just a, a lot of people who maybe were um, very intimidated to, to participate in our in-person programs. And the online space gives you, I think more control over how you present. Like you don't have to turn your video on, you don't have to, show yourself, you don't have to show your space if you don't want to, you can choose to choose more how you show up and how other people show up uh, in that space. So it's allowed people to access it. Maybe um, I'm thinking specifically of, you know, people who maybe are very religiously conservative and were maybe didn't feel comfortable in some of our spaces, um, just as an example, but, but there could be a lot of different ways people have been engaging. So I'm focusing on the positive right now. Obviously there's a lot of negatives to to the switch to online spaces and a lot of um, we've lost connection with a ton of people that that are just you know silent to us now and and maybe not engaging at all either not text not savvy in how to use the technology that we're using or um, just not motivated to connect in that way so I think um, once the lessons that we've learned we'll need to carry forward while also making sure we put a priority on 
having face-to-face -face time available for people. Um, so to bridge some of those gaps, I think our programming, which allows people to, the space to come in. Um, well, for one thing, we are, we are lending technology out. I think a lot of systems are doing that. We lend out Chromebooks and hotspots to people to use at home. Um, and that's been an important tool, but I think the human connection is more important. I think people can take a Chromebook home and it can just sit there. Um, so that's not the most important piece. Uh, and and what, we've, we've, what we've been able to do or what we're hoping to do more of is, you know, continue to create those spaces where people can come and ask questions and feel comfortable and feel like there's a space that's judgment free where they can get those questions answered, where they can play around with things um, without feeling fearful about it, where they can um, just kind of experiment. I think that's that's really where the learning will happen um, and that's what's needed. And we've also introduced digital navigator roles. Um, that's a new position that, that started, uh, well, it's just starting now where those people will offer kind of ongoing one-on-one -on -one face-to-face um, help in, in building those skills. So it's gonna be very, the, the human connection piece is very intensive. And then just as a last note, I think that um, something that's important to remember is that public libraries are being relied on too much for this to, to fill the gap. Um, I think that's one of the biggest issues right now. Um, yes, we can lend technology. Yes, we can provide services. Yes, we have staff who can assist with things, but we are not, we are not able to fill all the needs. So like when someone from human services is coming to us because they've been turned away because they can't access the application process for housing, that's a really big problem. That shouldn't be happening. I think that every single organization, um, government, nonprofit, you know, every, every organization needs to be looking at the way their processes work and, and figuring out where they can remove those barriers in the first place, um, instead of just relying on public libraries and, and other places to, to address the gaps that, that don't maybe need to exist as much in the first place. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot for that. That also ties into the, the, that, um, the point of the importance of training and feeling comfortable to engage in those spaces. But I also think that point regarding the um, over-reliance perhaps on libraries and the need for these synergies to, 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 um, to, to recognize the role that libraries can and do play, but also have like be a part of a larger support system where they aren't being a stopgap um, is quite an interesting perspective. So thank you. Um, and finally, uh, over to you, Jonathan. Um, in your experience, um, have, has this also had an impact on your experience in, in um, the work of libraries and how might libraries address challenges that, that, you've, that you have identified? Thank, thank you, Kerr. And well, I, I have to say that I'm impressed with Virginia examples. I think there are a, a very good input. And to address this question, I would like to say that I think there is a general understanding of the benefits of many of the new technology. We can agree that digital technologies have advanced more rapidly than any innovation in our history. And of course, they imply significant advantage in access to culture. We have now new models of creation, distribution, and civil participation. And the digital distributions uh, allows book, music, and other cultural manifestation to reach a large number of people. But, uh, especially, well, especially with new devices getting cheaper. However, we should bear in mind the barriers that currently prevent citizens from making full use of this advantage. And there are plenty of them. One of these barriers is the long studied digital divide. And in context uh, of Latin America, in, in this context, some particular gaps affect these regions. And we have, for example, the gap between dif different socioeconomic sectors, between urban and rural areas. And uh, I think, well, in Mexico, for example, there is the, the gap between the capital and the rest of the territory, uh, which is a very important gap. So all of this has a negative impact of, on access. Despite considerable progress in the past decade, there are still market disparities in, in Latin America in terms of access and infrastructure. And that's on one side, but we have another 
uh, digital divide that is becoming more dangerous uh, in Mexico and in Latin America in general. And it is the lack of digital skills to enjoy all of these uh, digital cultural expressions. People may have access to the devices and cities might have the infrastructure, but still they lack even basic skills to enjoy culture in digital formats. And people who need media and information literacy skills uh, may not know their skills are lacking at all. So that's important uh, to address. And another obstacle is the lack of cultural expression available online. And this is for many reasons. Uh, the English as a dominant language on the internet is, is one of them. The big internet companies based on one country. And of course, the rise of algorithm bias, which Ariana mentioned. Uh, that, be, uh, that I found very important to, to address. And this also renews the need to promote freedom of expression, the right to privacy and human rights in general. And what is the role of library in this? Libraries are becoming more essential in these three aspects. They are reducing the digital device as they provide infrastructure. They are improving people's skills. Uh, for example, many public and academic libraries in Mexico are developing a media and information literacy training, for example, regarding disinformation, which is a, a, a hot topic now and, and since two years ago. Uh, but they also offering online story times, which I think this is an important aspect uh, in promoting culture and local culture. For example, the National University here in Mexico started offering these services right after the pandemic began. And it was and it is still very successful children and young people from even uh, other Latin American countries have enjoyed these initiatives. Uh, and of course, libraries are still promoting um, um, fighting for, for, uh, for said freedom of expression. So uh, in sum, I, uh, we are living now in a platform society and the discussions around the global governance system for digital culture must adapt to this new reality to ensure that the diversity of cultural expression is protected and promoted, uh, of course, through the library. And this discussion must consider libraries as a key partner. We have several examples uh, in Latin America um, about how uh, with technology, they can get access to culture to different, uh, to different audience. Not only, for example, uh, in academic library, parliamentarian libraries, the national library, so uh, I think that there are plenty of examples to, to, to make this happen in other countries. Thank you, thank you very much. I think, um, I think that you've touched on a really important point that um, ties into a lot of different, it will tie into the next topic as well. And that is um, that question of what language is material available in um, when we're talking about cultural material, cultural expressions or educational material. Um, when we look to the internet, it, it can we can see a dangerous trend of going from plural lingualism to, to a very monolingual space. So I think that's an important point that perhaps we can bring over to, to our next discussion point. And I, I will move right ahead to that. Um, culture, culture and education um, should be closely linked informing one another and contributing together to sustainable development. Um, and I point to SDG target 4.7, in which all learners will acquire knowledge and skills to promote sustainable development. And this includes appreciation of cultural diversity and culture's contribution to sustainable development. Um, therefore, my question is, um, how do libraries work to create synergies between culture and education? And I know one issue in our sector is sometimes libraries will fall under ministries of education, ministries of culture, or a mix of two. And, um, and I think libraries sit really at a, an interesting intersection between culture and education that perhaps shouldn't be siloed as much as they are in some, in some cases. So um, regarding libraries creating synergies, I, I, I first will start um, by asking Rai, um, you're working in a, in a university around the issue of reconciliation. Um, and, and could you speak a bit to this, how culture and cultural heritage can, can impact on, on education and, and the role of libraries in this? Yeah, thanks, Claire. I, you know, I think 
in regards to the relationship between libraries and education, I mean, this is the most important relationship or it's kind of in many ways the raison d'etre for libraries. I mean, being in service of education, being in service of promotion, promoting knowledge, uh, learning, uh, access to information. I mean, that's that's the, the core mission of libraries. Um, now, what are the responsibilities that come along with that? Well, I think as we've been talking about through this uh, conversation, uh, you know, questions of human rights, human dignity, social justice, inclusion, um, respect, uh, anti-racism, I, I believe are fundamental pillars uh, through which and of which uh, libraries have to be seeing the world. Um, the skills-based work uh, is complementary to all of those things too. So as we help people navigate the digital divides or navigate our collections or navigate finding information, um, hopefully that's done in, in service of these bigger, uh, more important and fundamental uh, social values or, or social goods, I think. Um, so, you know, for us at, at the University of Victoria, at least, uh, when we think about something as big and perhaps as nebulous as reconciliation uh, or uh, something uh, like the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights or uh, the, um, uh, uh, the UNDRIP uh, articles that are articulated therein, or the sustain Sustainable Development Goals, I mean, these are fundamental lenses through which we're looking at all of our actions. And these are fundamental lenses through which we're looking at uh, how we uh, serve folks coming in and also provide those educational opportunities to help them understand what these things are. So it's the, the goal really is, is to deeply embed or enmesh these principles in our service at you know, the counter, in our physical spaces, uh, in the policies that we create, in the staff that we hire, uh, in the training that we provide staff, and certainly uh, in res all in response to the relationships that we build with other internal or external communities to the library itself. Um, so I don't know. I you know I I think in summary, I mean, education and libraries are just like hand in glove relationships. Uh, the question of what we educate on, though. I think is, um, you know, is perhaps different in different places, but I just like coming back down to these fundamental principles of what is going to help us create a better, more respectful society in the future and what's going to help us live together, both with the planet and with each other in a better way. And I really see, again, these, these fundamental human rights mechanisms as being uh, just a, an absolute um, uh, foundation and all of that and a core daily responsibility of libraries to promote and uphold and and uh, and value. Thank you for that. I think that that framing is really important. And I, you know, as we're talking about that, that embedding of these, these, um, um, these principles and in, in, in everything that libraries do, I, I, I really and, and answering that question of, of how do we create how do we use these to create a better society? I really see um, that work of libraries needing to be embedded into a, a, a larger work where, um, where we, we're promoting these, these fundamentals through our formal education, hand in hand with our non-formal education providers. And, um, and so there's the, that, that role that libraries play is, is, is really tied, really must be recognized and tied to the work that's being done in a larger sense. So, so thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think I'll, I'll move now back to you, Virginia. There are many intersections between cultural and linguistic diversity in this topic. Um, in your work, uh, how does the library create, create those synergies between culture and, and education opportunities for, for people? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? I wasn't sure. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I think that um, in library spaces, we sort of have um, an advantage in, in creating a synergy between culture and education over maybe more traditional education spaces, just because there's so many, um, there's so much like of a power dynamic entrenched in those um, institutions where there is a teacher and a student dynamic. And I think we can get around that in some interesting ways. 
um, where someone is maybe doing reference with you, but they're on your level. Um, and there's a lot to be improved, I think, in like who's an authority on what and why. And, um, and I think we do that through some of our programming by really working hard to, 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 to break down those patterns um, and, and shift things around um, by having people work in by just even even just by avoiding the look of a classroom um, and that that structure of a classroom and having small group work where you're not really sure it's not clear from looking at it who is the student and who is the teacher and that's sort of the 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 dynamic that we are going for um, everybody who's showing up to library spaces is already inherently like a self-directed learner um, they're what they're what they're focusing on is being driven by um, what they're interested in and that is going to be automatically um, hopefully more a more culturally sensitive approach uh, and a more equal um, approach to to the education space so we do a lot of education but but I think it's more linked to what is driving people to to be there and and bringing their own experience and their own knowledge um, but it is really important to stay focused on that I think it's really easy to fall into patterns that you've been used to your entire life. Um, when we have English conversation groups, if we're not constantly saying, don't set this up like a classroom, then people, it automatically gets set up like a classroom um, because that's what people are used to. And I think, so you have to really be thinking and challenging it all the time um, because we, we don't need to be a classroom in the same way. Um, we're a different space and we're a different thing. So I think training staff, um, the way you set up your space and structure your space um, allows for people to come in with really, really different starting points, with different levels of engagement with formal education. People who wouldn't fit into a mold in other institutions are going to be able to engage more easily. Um, and it validates a lot of different experiences and different learning methods uh, in, a, in a space that's more free of judgment. Thank you. I think I think that's really interesting of this, like this breaking down of a paradigm of, of the, the power of the teacher versus student. Um, and I think just to to go back to the to to the reason that we're doing this when we're we're looking at what what can be changed and what can what can we look at when we're talking about um, about policy, I think looking at that, um, putting that focus on how do we break down these these paradigms that are entrenched in some of our um, systems that are excluding people and um, embed that when we're looking ahead and talking about innovation. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Hayford. Um, as you've seen an expansion of the role of libraries in your country, how have they um, impacted on linking culture and education? Okay, so... Okay, thank you very much. Um, the good thing about uh, the Ghanaian uh, context, uh, context is that um, the, the library operations falls under the Ministry of Education. And the Ministry of Education, of course, is responsible for making sure that our citizens are educated. So the role of the library authority since the 1950s has been positioned to be able to support lifelong learning uh, whether through the formal education system or out of school system, or I mean formal education system or out of school system, and 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 that role is what we continue to play uh, to, to date. But I think uh, moving forward, moving forward, the, there are more opportunities for us to be able to make sure that um, it 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 becomes a deliberate attempt to make sure that cultural uh, expressions becomes really embedded within this, within the educational system. So that there is really this strong synergy between uh, culture and education. And we've seen, we've seen quite a few of that uh, with the last review of the education curriculum. And so for pre tertiary education in this country, what we have seen is that in the new curriculum that has been developed, there has been a deliberate attempt to embed all sort of example using culturally relevant context. Because if you do not do that, 
and you continue to bring Cambridge resources and, 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 and you know, scholastic resources from all over the world, and you embed it, you are, you are subtly losing your identity through the educational system uh, that you are offering uh, for, for your future, uh, your, for, for your future uh, uh, leaders. And so what we have done is, of course, look at the systemic, um, the systemic strategies of how do we embed all of these cultural expressions to be able to make sure that we do not lose our identity within the scheme of how we educate our citizens. Again, libraries have always been known as a repository of knowledge, a repository of cultural resources. And if you, if you, if you, if we really want to be deliberate, we should not limit the availability of cultural resources only in the public library space, but also in the school library spaces. How do you make sure that there is that linkage for resource exchange so that you know a lot of appropriate resources uh, relevant to the culture of the society is made available within the school library spaces. And I think once that there's the deliberate attempt to embed that through policy direction, you will, you will begin to see uh, you know, um, resilient being built in that space uh, so that we do not, because the whole significance of this is that societies don't lose their identity. I mean, that is the whole purpose of this, of all of these initiatives that we are trying to uh, talk about. And again, we need to continue to build collaboration. Uh, collaboration is always key in terms of how do cultural institutions build relationships with educational institutions so that we work together to make sure that whoever is assessing education or whoever is assessing uh, culture, at the end of the day, there is that intersection for all of us to benefit from whatever that is available. Thank you. I think that is that's such an important point of, um, of, of embedding cultural expressions, one's, one's own cultural expressions into, into the way curriculums are being designed. And your point of um, you know, reaching out to all different kinds of libraries and, and school libraries, especially through, um, th through, through policy um, development, that can, be, that can be really critical. Um, and I think you've touched on something really important there. So thank you for that. Um, and I, I'll move back to, to you, Jonathan. Um, you, um, not only are you a researcher and a, a professor, professor of librarianship, I know you've done work around libraries and the, and the sustainable development goals. So how do you see libraries creating these synergies between cultural, culture and education and, and, and perhaps especially around um, the support of, of those relevant SDGs? Thank you, Karen. Well, uh, this question addressed I think that there is an echo. Oh, of course, oh, yeah, thank you. Well, I think this question addresses an essential aspect of culture in general, which is the link with education as uh, some of, of, of my colleagues mentioned. And I would like to highlight a phrase on the UNESCO 2001 Universal Declaration of, of Cultural Diversity, stating that education that respect cultural identity guarantees cultural rights. And well, this is aligned with high form inputs. So uh, nowadays it's important to mention that this global landscape is increasingly complex and uncertain. So uh, while, while it is increasingly recognized that education, that culture, culture and rich education, this relationship uh, must be rethought in alignment with today's opportunities and challenges, particularly in light of technology. And this is important because culture in general and cultural identity in, in, are often as the margins of education systems. It's getting banished uh, from the curricula or as UNESCO mentioned, uh, is perceived as a luxury addition. So, and that's a big issue for cultural heritage safeguards. So historically libraries have served as a mediating structures between groups and their records documenting their lives. So there is a high risk of, uh, of division or fragmentation when no structure like libraries ensures future generation access to all of this cultural heritage. So with this in mind, and back to your main question, how do libraries create synergies between culture and education? 
first of all, uh, uh, I think that we have many examples of this. Uh, libraries through developing creative skills in cultural and artistic fields. So this can be, and this can be made through cultural partnership. Uh, we have talked about this. Um, uh, for example, there are many countries in Latin America that have partnership, uh, such as cultural education partnership or joint work with the arts and culture sector. So uh, libraries can connect people to their history and heritage and give a sense of meaning and self-confidence, and of course, develop empathy and critical thinking qualities. So uh, a lesson learned from the pandemic is that learning is no longer focused on formal settings in schools. It can be online, it can be in cultural institutions, uh, such as libraries or local communities through intergenerational learning among others. So, uh, regarding the SDGs, in Latin America, we have many examples of this. All of them are in the library map of the world, which I highly recommend to visit to, uh, or to recommend some stories because we need to, to put more stories and, on this library map of the world, which is a, a, a advocate tool you know, for, for, for policy uh, decisions. And for instance, I would like to mention two examples. In Colombia, school librarians and science teachers, they are working together to improve children and environmental literacy. That's a good example of how librarians and teachers are working together to make this happen, to, to, to prove that libraries are uh, making uh, this, uh, all of this improvement on this SDG. Another example is in Argentina, a libraries literacy project become a school for adults leading to social and civic empowerment of the Roma community. So that's another example of how library is turning you know, to these educational programs and they taking this as an example for other communities. And we have more several examples in Mexico, for example, we have many public libraries that are working together with academic libraries to make programs for these communities. There are some uh, public libraries that are work, working on content, uh, on content generations, you know, on, of content creators uh, from their own communities with some other library uh, research centers in, ac across Mexico. So this is also reflect, a reflection of the importance of the pedagogical role of libraries, not only in the region, but around the world and not just as open spaces of non-formal education and life learning learning, but in their capacity to spark debate and encourage the public to ask questions about social issues and develop critical thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think, um, I think the, that, that point you touched on of um, culture being considered a, a luxury perhaps, um, it, it, that is that is quite a, a, a challenge, and and you've just concluded on the the role that that this can play, that culture can play in 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 creating sort of these conversations or these sorts of participatory processes. Um, so thank you. I think um, and and a good good call out to the library map of the world. There are many stories there um, that are very practical, and and with an eye on the time, I, I finally will turn back to you, Ariadna. Um, of course, being able to learn from um, cultural heritage and digital material, you need to be able to access it. Um, so could you speak a bit to, to in that regard, to um, the, the synergy between culture and education? Uh, yes, thank you, Claire. I think I'll, I'll be relatively short on, on this one, and I'm really impressed at all the uh, examples and great stories that have been shared so far. In, in the context that I work in, we, uh, so digital cultural heritage, we're a little bit far away from the people who um, would normally come to the library or, or engage with the heritage. So we don't see that directly. But in the area of education, I can uh, speak about some of the things that a colleague of mine is doing to uh, try to build strong links with uh, those who teach, uh, be it in a school or elsewhere. Um, to raise awareness uh, uh, of the availability of digitized cultural heritage that can be brought into the classroom. 
Um, and I think a lot of these efforts relate to some of the things that have been said earlier about um, making sure that people learn to think critically, uh, that people consult the source. Um, so uh, if we talk about historical events, we do have some of the historical sources that can illustrate why we think about certain things in a certain way. Um, so to kind of uh, trigger critical thinking among the students and and um, a more original way for a teacher to prepare a classroom and to connect people with the uh, some of the sources that we have managed to preserve and, and share. Um, so, well, I think bringing this cultural heritage that libraries care so much about preserving into a classroom is one of the uh, very good links that, that can be made between what libraries do and education. Um, I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you. And of course, that ties back to the, the your points that you made earlier around the need to be able to um, disseminate and, and use this this material um, in, in different applications, including in, in this one that you've mentioned here. Um, so now we have just 20 minutes left in this session, and I want to take this time to turn back to what we've already discussed through these questions and, and through all of your input in your perspectives, you've raised a lot of different um, initiatives that are already being done, understandings that we have, um, and of course we're all here from the library sector, but understandings we have of how libraries impact on this. But now I'd like to ask you to turn a little bit more outward and a little bit um, more forward looking. And so I'll, I will pose the question to you, um, what are some examples of initiatives or policies, and these could be at the local, the national, or the international level, um, that libraries need in order to more effectively enable their communities' participation in culture? Um, you know, what are some gaps that should be addressed? What are some needs that should be heard? And feel free to kind of to speak freely or to speak imaginatively. Um, in, in that regard. So um, I will go back to you, Ariadna, um, as, as you are working in policy um, in, in, in drawing on this discussion here. I know you've already given some, but um, in, in a short recap, can you give an idea of, of, of what policy changes do we need to see in order to enable your work more? Um, thank you, Claire. Um, so um, I think my answer will focus again on the on the area that I uh, mostly work in and some of the policies that have been very helpful so far. Um, and I can also talk about some further areas for development, but in the European context, I think some of the policies that have been extremely useful are some of the recommendations that the European Commission made um, over the years on the digitization of cultural heritage, for instance, in 2011, there were a set of recommendations from the commission that were um, very uh, forward-looking and optimistic. Um, as recommendations, they are not um, an obligation for member states to fulfill, but still it kind of uh, drew, a picture, drew a picture of where we want to be in about 10 years that was rather ambitious. Not everything has been fulfilled, but it gives a common direction um, across Europe that can be very useful and some of the things that were there are things that a lot of cultural heritage institutions really believe in. So it also offers a kind of a very official document that there is willingness at the policy level to reach uh, this point and, and that can sustain a lot of the advocacy efforts that some cultural heritage institutions were doing. And some of these policies are now turning into uh, focusing a lot more on the data maybe uh, not so much on the people, but we're also talking, well, in this context about digital cultural heritage and now talking about common data spaces uh, in the last recommendations that the commission published, um, a place where data can be reusable, is interoperable so that we can, can connect several platforms, several relevant sources, and that it can be used for research and, and other public interest um, uses. Um, so I, again, th I think having this sort of vision, even if it's not an obligation, a sort of recommendation by the highest level of policymakers in, in the European context uh, has, uh, that also recognizes very much the importance and continuously repeats the importance of the function of these institutions and of the cultural heritage they preserve is, is really essential. Um, so I think continuing in this direction, there's 
still some gaps, but uh, having this very official recognition of some of these principles is, is really important. Thank you so much. Um, well heard. Um, and so now um, back to you, Hayford. Um, uh, in, in all of your experience, you've seen, of course, this, this sort of rebirth and growth of libraries in Ghana. Um, could you give some idea of, of the, the policies that you've seen be, already be effective in this way and what are gaps and what are recommendations you might make um, for the future? All right, thank you. Thank you once again. Um, so these have been the, the approaches that we've tried to use in Ghana. Uh, within the, the, the environment that I, I operate, you actually get a lot of, uh, especially if you are public library institutions, you, you usually or any government state agency that is responsible for providing social services or cultural services, just like the library authority, you want to make sure that your actions are embedded within a broad government uh, development agenda or within an, a broad government policy framework. And the way we have been able to accelerate the development of libraries or accessibility of knowledge resources to our citizens is how in 2018, for example, we managed to have um, uh, government make commitment to the support of public libraries through its educational strategic plan for 2018 to 2030. And so I think libraries should begin to find opportunities within government priority programs and be able to um, be able to find its way within those spaces because it is the government usually will design their annual budgets around those long term policy issues. And so that is how we've strategically been able to position ourselves and also there's a strong encouragement for public private partnerships within within the public uh, within the public space in Ghana and so institutions like the library authority has been working to be able to make sure that in our delivery of digital uh, digital uh, literacy opportunities for our citizens we cannot do it alone on our own budget but how do we collaborate with other state actors? For example, the Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communication that has been able to give us some computer, uh, uh, computer uh, uh, and tablet devices, laptop and all of that. You know, it is their laptop that we are using for the mobile library, ICT library project, which won us the United Nations uh, Public Service Awards. And so these sort of collaborations, including corporate institutions like Vodafone, that has also been able to support us to be able to establish technology hubs where training are taking place. Those familiar with the telcos, you know of MTN, MTN support to the library authority to, to and, and building and establishing these modern centers, um, centers for us to be able to uh, take over and, and money. So these sort of PPP partnerships, I think, should be encouraged within this space to be able to get uh, get our citizens access to more uh, more culturally relevant uh, opportunities. Of course, there should be also in all of this there should be a, a, an investment in R and D research and development. Uh, is something that uh, is not really prominent, uh, you know, in, 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 in our part of the world. And that is what I'm hoping that, you know, for us to be able to make very, uh, very, um, very evidence-based argument uh, to be able to attract the needed support so that we can really do and provide the services that our citizens need. I think there needs to be a lot of investment in it. So this will be my uh, summary points for now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn directly back to Jonathan. Um, same question to you, a recommendation of policy gaps. Um, what, what is your take on this question? Thank you, Claire. Well, I think that uh, this will very much depend of the context of, uh, of your region, but I will address it in a general context. So first of all, and I think it's one of the most crucial issues is the one related to legislation in a broad sense, legislation on copyright, uh, on the distribution of online cultural goods and services, as in the case, for example, of the fixed price for eBooks. And uh, well, there are other aspects that it's important to mention. Many countries are modernizing the processes of legal deposit of artworks. So particularly those created with digital media. 
So, um, and there is also a need to strengthen other international mechanisms, such as the Marrakech Treaty. Uh, IFLA, for example, is doing a great job of mobilizing uh, library association and, and uh, policy makers on, on, on this, but uh, we need more actions in, in many countries. No? And I have to say that there are important steps on legislations in Latin America. Uh, as an example, I can tell the National Library of Mexico is working on several of these examples, uh, improving and, and making the, uh, the implementation of the Marrakech Treaty you know, in a broad sense in, in all Mexico, but still many more countries, uh, particularly in Latin America, need reforms, uh, serious reform in all these matters. So there is, a, there is a still a, an essential disparity between countries uh, on, on legislation. Uh, so while the legislation aspect is solved, I think that we can start by making policies oriented to simplifying online access to cultural expressions uh, housed in glam institutions either through the digitization of materials or the consolidation of catalogs available on the internet. So, and of course, this has to be uh, with the whole cultural industry and cultural institution ecosystem, such as libraries. Uh, we need libraries in the drafting and implementation of major national plans on cultural participation programs and digital in inclusion. And I would like to conclude the, uh, this question with something that UNESCO has also been underlining, the need for more research on the specific aspects of culture. I mean, culture and libraries, culture and uh, education. We have so many data available, but we need some uh, research aspect on, uh, on several regards. And for example, uh, one of, of, of IFLA, for example, is doing some research on SDG and culture, uh, but we need more research on every country on, on these regards. Thank you very much. Um, those, are, those are very key points um, and are well noted. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and I'm sorry, we are running very short on time, so I will ask everyone to be very brief. Um, Rai, I, I will turn to you next. The same question, um, what in your opinion is, is needed in terms of gaps or um, policy development? Yeah, and I'll just be brief here uh, and at risk of being a bit of a broken record. I think um, one of the exciting and complex developments here in Canada over the last three to four years or so has been this country's move away from rejecting or um, not supporting the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples towards adoption of that mechanism toward now to introducing uh, legislation at the federal level and here in the province that I live in. Uh, this legislation says that Canada has a requirement now to harmonize its laws with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, federally and here in the province. We're just at the outset of this. We're just at the outset of understanding really what this means and rolling this implementation out. But this will, um, I think, fundamentally change how many cultural memory institutions have approached their relationship with Indigenous peoples up to this point in time. Uh, up to this point in time, work with Indigenous peoples has been sort of framed in kind of the right thing to do or perhaps a, an act of benevolence. And really, uh, I mean, there's been some success in certain regards, but it, I don't think we've seen the country fully understand or appreciate the extent and depth of responsibilities and the, the fundamental violation of some of the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples that continue to this day. So moving forward, when we, when we take a step back and think broadly what, what this country needs at least to establish and maintain respectful relationships is uh, to, to see this fundamental human rights uh, mechanism uh, as being a framework for reconciliation and a fundamental core responsibility of all sectors of society to breathe life into. That applies to libraries, that applies to archives, that applies to museums, that applies to galleries. Uh, and it will 
directly result in some very significant and I think profound changes in terms of how libraries and archives, museums, galleries operate and function. Thank you. I think that's really important that in terms of um, that filtering down of international um, international declarations, they really need to be um, adapted at the national and then at the subnational, at the provincial, local level. So work that we can do. And I'd be if we had more time, I'd be really keen to hear what work was done in terms of advocacy to to get to that. But perhaps that's something we can dig into on another day. So finally, I will turn to you, Virginia, with the same question. Um, you've mentioned some gaps, but do you have any um, in terms of a, a policy that can help the library be more effective in this regard? Sure. I think if we back up for a bigger scope outside of library systems, um, and I, I think uh, language access, um, pushing more towards language justice and really thinking about what that means in going beyond just translating a document or interpreting a meeting. It's it's really like a much bigger thing that needs wide work from uh, whole city governments, uh, regional governments to, to address. Um, then also, I would say this might seem a little outside the scope, but I think um, at least from living in Denver, our public transportation, um, uh, structure is really not adequate. And I think that's the case in a lot of places where access to, to culture and participation in culture is really limited by that. Um, and then finally, I think that there's sort of this um, approach to at least for immigrant and refugee services, um, there's, there's sort of an approach in, in many different organizations in libraries and government of trying to solve the issue of not being able to connect with specific communities by creating um, these part-time, very part-time or on-call or contract sort of navigator role positions. Um, I think that's gonna be a big problem going forward um, that, that is, is, is intended to address an issue but ends up perpetuating a lot of problems um, as people who represent other languages are, or other cultures are, are still sort of like at the outskirts of an organization or, um, and I understand that's how my program operates too. So it's something that we need to fix internally and then also look at on a much wider scope because I think it's a method that's been used to address this um, at, in many organizations. And that like, you can't just dump all of the role of outreach and connection and navigation into these, these roles. Um, that work needs to be reflected in every single or, um, position within libraries and within other organizations. And at every level, there needs to be um, investment in people uh, with full-time positions um, in, in every single role within the library of people who speak other languages, people who represent other cultures, and it can't just be relegated to to an on-call thing, to a part-time thing. Um, I think we'll need to look at that in the years to come. Thank you. I think that's such an interesting point that you touched on regarding the transportation structure. And it shows how um, intersectoral these issues are of, um, of access and really how we need to be, um, be getting involved in these more multi-sectoral discussions, multilateral discussions around um, access. and. And with that, we are at the end of our time. I know this has been a long session. So thank you to everyone. I, I have seen some questions come up um, that have been answered directly in the Q&A. And I hope some of the other questions we didn't get to kind of were answered through, um, through some of the discussions we've had here. But please feel free to, um, to contact me if you have any other questions. A recording of this will be made available and a summary will be made available um, because I think we have such interesting topics here. I really want to make sure that we can refer back to them and that we can disseminate some of the discussion we've had here um, with those who couldn't join us today. I know with um, time zones, it becomes very difficult to join live, but we will be doing what we can to share this conversation. And again, um, the summary of this conversation and it's the main function of this event is to inform UNESCO. So IFLA HQ will be turning all of this into a, um, a series of responses um, to UNESCO's questions and um, submitting that to help inform the Mandia cult um, um, preparatory process. 
So I invite everyone to follow IFLA as we are continuing in this process um, and any other opportunities or to get involved or news um, will be shared out with our networks. Um, so I want to take just this final opportunity to thank you all very much again on behalf of IFLA for sharing your knowledge, your experience and your insight with us today. It is so valuable and um, I'm, I, I feel very energized from this. I know it's been long, so um, let's all, we can take, we can go off now to, um, to our other things, but um, thank you for coming together to have this discussion today. And um, I, I look very much further forward to working with you in different capacities in the future. Um, so thank you again. And with that, I, um, I will close today's session, but thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Bye. 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 Bye